Katangi te titi, katangi te kaka, katangi hoki kiao, tihe moriora. Ena mana, ena reo, ena hoe fa. Rarangitirama, tena koto katoa. No mai harimai ki te fare wananga a waitaha. No mai harimai piki mai ki te rangi ako me te haora. Ke te mana whenua, tena koto. Tena koe an, na mihi nui ki a koe. Na mihi mahana ki a kato katoa. He kaupapa whakahira hira i tenei rā. Nā reira, rā rangatira mā, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Well, it's lovely to see all of you here this evening for um, this prestige lecture um, by Professor Emerita Ann Edwards from the University of Oxford Department of Education. I had the good fortune and great pleasure to have met Ann last year when um, I was awarded the Oxford Fellowship by the university to go, and it was well worth my time, and Anne was so gracious to um, have spent some time with me and talk about her work, and it struck me how valuable that could be to our ongoing conversations around education in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So Anne comes to us, as I said, as Professor Emerita from Oxford, and um, she was the chair of the uh, at the University of Leeds in Birmingham, and then became the director of the department um, of education at Oxford um, for a, a number of years where she did some quite instrumental work around partnerships and collaboration. She's also the director of research and uh, is in fact the former president of the British Educational Research Association. So she's done visiting professorships at Oslo and um, been awarded the Doctors Honoris Causa by Helsinki, by the Universities of Helsinki and Oslo, and was the co-founder with Jeff Hayward of the Oxford Center for Sociocultural and Activity Historical Research, which um, was a great scholarly community um, of like-minded folks that I had the pleasure of working with where I was there. So I was very pleased um, to be able to have that opportunity. And based on that work, Anne has been the founding editor of the Learning, Culture, and Social Interactions and remains on that editorial board today. So you can see from those things that she's led and the way she's um, uh, created those, through her leadership, created those opportunities, that her research draws on a cultural historical approach to learning and focuses on the professional learning and in particular the relational turn and expertise and the concepts of relational expertise, common knowledge, and relational agency. And um, I need to, at this point, make a small caveat and uh, humble apologies because in the, Anne very graciously is only here with us for three days and she's offered to do three different things and in my quick movement through things. I placed her presentation yesterday onto our conversations for today, but she's actually going to be taking those concepts around relational um, work and agency and conversations at, out of the teacher education context and into this conversation about supporting young people through transitions. And for those of us who are teacher educators, those transitions exist for our students as well into that professional state of practice and across their presentations. So much of her work is presented this evening, that she presents this evening, comes from a current book and she's very graciously um, put back there this flyer so that you can pre-order the book and um, get a bit of a discount, which is always a nice opportunity for those of us who are um, uh, bibliophiles and love to have the hard copies of things. So in this presentation this evening, working on challenging transitions, um, building common knowledge to create bridges between practices, Anne talks about how entering a new practice and navigating its expectations offer challenges to most newcomers. But for some children and young people, the challenges can be particularly demanding. So Anne discusses examples of these demands and how they've been addressed in a range of initiatives. These examples come from an impress collection that we just talked about and where the authors draw on two key ideas to explain the initiatives, the motive orientation and common knowledge. Motive orientation is brought into play when a person makes a transition into a new practice and needs to identify the key expectations in that practice so that they can create new motives to shape their intentions. The idea of common knowledge arose in Anne's work on interprofessional collaborations, and it consists of knowledge of what matters in more than one practice becoming a resource for that interprofessional collaboration. So we're very pleased to be able to have Anne share more about this work and give us food for thought. Um, and 
and add to our kete of knowledge in these key areas. So with no further ado, Anne, I'd like to welcome you. on before I start. So I thank you all for turning up and um, thank you for your kind introduction. I decided to, to um, work on this talk this evening, not, not um, because of trying to sell the book, <laughs> but because uh, of the way of, of listening to Letitia's really interesting talk when she was in, in Oslo and thinking, sorry, in Oslo, in Oxford, in Oxford, like in Oxford, and, to, and thinking about how that did resonate with some of the ideas that were, that were, in, the, were in the book, that kind of, uh, the delicacy that's needed in supporting young people from one culture to another uh, and one practice to another. Um, so, I'm going to be talking a little bit about collaboration, so you are going to get some of the, con if you came here to hear about collaboration, you are going to get some of the collaboration concepts. But really this came out of some work that um, I was doing well, with Mariana Hedegor, and at the end of a very heavy day, we sat down in her lovely sitting room with the light coming in, and uh, with glasses of wine in our hands, and, and just thought about what, what connected our work and why we, we were able to work so well together. And it seemed to us, because Mariana is, Mariana Hedegor, who I'm going to talk about, Mariana Hedegor is um, somebody who's been doing a lot of work on transitions and um, how young people from uh, different types of family backgrounds make the transition into school. That's been primarily what she's been working on. And she's been thinking about how do, young, how do children whose motive orientation may not be towards learning get supported when they move into a place where they're required to become a, a pupil. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is, is my work on common knowledge and understanding of what matters in one practice, where, in this case where the child might be coming from, and what matters in the practice in which they're going towards. And so we thought we'd bring those two concepts together. And I hope that what I'm going to be talking about with the examples will, will help you see how that works and how that can actually offer some explanation for uh, the kind of support that's needed for some of these really challenging transitions that we've gathered together in, in the book. So the key, conce oops, whoop, the key concepts that I'm going to talk about are, um, mo are practice. I want to be clear about what I mean by practice. Motive orientation and common knowledge. And the argument is that, we, that, that I'm making is that common knowledge forms a kind of bridge between one practice and another, between the motive orientations that play in one practice and the motive, motive orientations that play in another. And I'm going to take three examples from um, the book. So that's moving from school to work for young people with autism, which is the study, a study I did. Entry to school in rural Chile, um, uh, which is a study done by two researchers from the University of uh, Western Sydney. And then a, a, a little bit about some work that I did with a colleague, uh, Maria Evangelou, on uh, school readiness, where we critique the notion of school readiness um, in, in, in terms of how it's being played out in some initiatives in the UK. And then one project which is not in this book, but in a number of uh, two other books that I've edited about um, uh, transitions um, from rural communities into, into more formal schooling in, in Rajasthan. So those, those are going to be the examples which I, I hope will put some flesh on some of the concepts. So I'm going to start by going through the concepts and being clearer about the concepts. So what, what do I mean by practices? Those of you who were in my session yesterday will see that. Uh, there's a strong emphasis on the historicity of the practices within the framework that I'm working with. So practices are historically accumulated, they're carrying the history, there's, they are knowledge laden, there is emotion in them in the sense that our, identity, our identities are formed and played out in our practices. And, and, they are, and practices are given direction by what is valued by those who inhabit them. So it's value laden too. And please notice the, the verb, we inhabit practices. Practices are not so much what we do in the, in the way I'm talking about practices, but practices are things we walk into that have been trodden by other people and their histories are in there too. So practices are inhabited by people 
who interpret the demands in practices and they may orient them they may orient their motives towards those demands so beginning to get to a definition of motive orientation an orientation towards the demands that we recognize and want to approach and so there are lots of book plugs as I go through this so this getting closer to the notion of um, of motive orientation. This comes from um, a book that Mariana Hedegor and Marilyn Fleer and I put together. And what we're saying there is that institutional practices, and, and an institution in this sense could be a family as well as a school, uh, create recurrent demands. And those demands are found in the activities. And I'll give you some examples of that a bit later on. And people learn to recognize and orient themselves towards those demands and they need to do that if they're to propel themselves forward to learn to become expert within the within the practices so we need to be able to approach the demands the recurrent demands that are in the practices and Hedegaard has called this process motive orientation the, the willingness the ability to recognize and approach the particular recurrent demands that constitute the practice and so, of course, we can see, if we see, if we accept that, we can see sometimes that some transitions can be extremely demanding. Um, so for everybody, as people move between practices, or if practices change around us, and I'll give some examples of that, they need to recognize and orient themselves towards the new demands and develop new motive orientations. Mariana uses the word competences. She says people need to develop new competences when they get into those new settings. And we did a special issue of learning culture and, um, uh, and interact, social interaction on motives, and that came out in 2014. So if you want to follow that up, I don't know whether you take LCSI, but... Um, it's an Elsevier journal, so I'm a bit embarrassed about anything. <laughs> but anyway, um, but what, 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 what we argued in there is that children acquire new motives as they anticipate or enter a new practice. And these new motives may be contradictory to earlier leaning motives. And the child's motive orientation and competence may need to be restructured. Just to give, just to put some flesh on that, um, several years ago, I was at a ARA conference, and um, Marilyn Fleer um, had some video clips of um, a family and a young, a young boy. He was um, five or six years old, and he was just, he was in his first year at schooling. And so the, the family were um, in a very poor, socially deprived area of, um, of Melbourne. And uh, what she did, a, Marilyn did a kind of tracking of how the family moved around. Um, and they, they, they barely sat still. They moved around all the time. So there was a carpet, no chairs, big television. Kitchen had, had a cooker and everything in it, but no, no cooking was done. And what happened was that when the, fam, when the food came in, it came in in polystyrene cartons. There was chips and different sauces to pour on the chips. And the kids all ran at the food, gathered up their bit, and then went off and sat on the carpet arms around the food and ate. Um, and so she then followed this same child into school. And what, I mean, it was heartbreaking to watch. There was this boy sitting on a, on a high bench. Um, teacher was talking. Um, and this lad had no idea that he should be concentrating on the teacher. Said of which he was looking at what the boy next door to him and what the girl next door to him was doing. And he was kind of copying what was going on. And not, you could see he was not listening to the teacher at all. Then um, a little bell went and it was, it was juice time. He was off that stool before anybody else to get his juice because that was what his motive orientation was. So we can see how, you know, how powerful the notion is and how challenging it can be for some young children. And I'm going to give you an example from a very different family in Denmark, which is part of the same project that Marilyn was involved in, where you can see the kinds of advantages that those children were coming with. So um, it, it's an important topic. Um, of course, transitions can also 
occur when practices change around them. So, you know, we can see how, it's rather a stereotypical picture of how, how teaching has changed and the way a teacher might position themselves. But I'm involved in a project, this time ac accurately in Oslo, um, where um, we're looking at how um, people over 50, 55 in the workplace are... Um, are or are not developing new skills when new technologies come in to the workplace. And we're using these ideas in order to theorize what's, what's going on in terms of the tra kind of transitions they have to make to changes within the workplace. So, um, an important topic. I want to just get into um, so a little bit of detail. So again, so it will, it will help, I think, when we look at the, exa at the examples. Here's a nice picture of Mariana. Here to go. Um, Mariana has um, a, 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 a way of helping us think about the relationship between society, practice, activity, and action. And I could spend the next hour just talking about this, but I really just really want to focus on um, the, her arguments that society, for example, government policies, um, represent a particular way of thinking. She's Danish, so she talks about traditions, but for us, for most of us, it would be ways of thinking in terms of policy priorities, which would come out of the politics of whoever's in power. And then what matters would be the motives and the priorities that are represented within, within the policies. Institutions such as families have practices in which there are motives and values embedded in those practices. And those motives get played out in the way that activity system settings are, stru are structured and the kinds of actions that take place within the, um, within, within the setting. And these are, are shaped by the, the prevailing motives, the purposes that operate within the practices and then get played out in the activities and in the actions. So I'm going to give you, just take you through an, an, an example from the, the a middle class family in Denmark, um, just to get a sense of what that actually means um, with, with some flesh on it. So if you can imagine a large, um, Art Nouveau, um, elegant um, apartment in Fredericksburg, which is a very posh part of Copenhagen, and there's lots of dark furniture and beautiful artifacts around. And uh, mother is sitting at the dining table reading a newspaper. And she folds up the newspaper, and Laura knows it's 10.30, time to do Saturday morning homework, and sits next to her and starts unasked, on her homework and she, she can see her mother looking at her homework and um, uh, which is a horror story and she says before her mother says anything oh, it, it's a draft it's okay to be sloppy um, so you're beginning to get a sense of mother's um, motives and and, and 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 what goes on in that particular family practice Lulu joins them and takes out her maths homework. Now, Lulu is a problematic child. I've seen so much about the family. That, and uh, she really finds maths difficult when her mother is watching her doing it. Um, and mother notices that Lulu's not engaged and asks her to figure out how old her grandmother is, which sounds a bit difficult. And Lulu says she wants to stop doing homework. And then mother says something. Sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do. Again, you can see the family motives. Emil arrives toy cash register, starts to make money. So he, he doesn't have to do homework, but he's, he, he wants to join in and do homework. And he writes the number 100 the wrong way around, and mother corrects him. And so again, you can begin to see the motives. And then Katya, who's four, decides, well, they're all, they're all being very purposeful. So she goes off to a bedroom, rummages around, and comes back in wearing a blouse, which she has buttoned up, and tells everybody, I put it on myself. So you can see in, in those what those four children are doing, what the, motive, the motives are within the practice and how those children are in their different ways because they're different ages, orienting themselves towards the motives that are prevailing within that particular practice. And of course, you can see how advantaged they are over the young man from Melbourne, the boy from Melbourne, in terms of making that transition. So I'm... So that's really, I think, my kind of summary, I hope, and an explanation of what I mean by motive orientation. So in practice, motive orientation. I now want to get on to just thinking a little bit 
about common knowledge. Uh, some of you would have seen this slide uh, yesterday, but um, as, as Letitia said, I've done uh, a lot of work on interprofessional collaboration. Uh, so how teachers and social workers and health workers work together. And I was looking at what happened when you bring those practices together in order to work on a complex problem like a family that's having difficulty or a child who's having poor attendance record at school or those kinds of complex problems where more than one professional is involved. And I wanted to see how the motives of each of these professions were brought together and, and, and were able to work together because I recognized that in each of those practices there would be different professional motives. So for the social worker, the social worker would want to concentrate on strengthening the family whereas the teacher would be um, primarily interested in school attendance because you've got to get the child into school before they can even begin to learn. Um, and the housing person might be very much more concerned with um, the stability of the housing arrangements uh, and, and, whether, and whether or not they could stay in that particular home. So I asked the question, what kind of expertise is involved in bringing together those motives so that they can work and, and collaborate um, successfully on, on um, for example, turning around the trajectory of a child who's at risk of social exclusion? And looking over a number of projects, and glad, no, this is 10, 10 years' work refined into one slide here, but I found that successful practitioners developed these relational expertise, built common knowledge, and exercised relational agency. And I, the common knowledge aspect is the most important part for, to, for today's talk, but I, I will mention uh, re, uh, uh, the, uh, relational agency in a moment. So relational expertise is knowing how to elicit what matters to you and their mot uh, uh, sorry, what matters to others, what their professional motives are, or if their family is what the family motive is. And, how, and it also involves being explicit about what matters for you, what your professional motives are. And sometimes professionals tend to hide that because they feel they shouldn't be doing it, but um, uh, making that explicit is, is part of uh, relational expertise. Common knowledge, which I'm going to really be talking much more about, consists of the motives of the collaborating partners. So an understanding of the motives of all the part, potential partners who would be working. It's not about knowing what they do, but it's knowing what matters for them. And relational agency is joint purposeful activity to interpret and respond to a problem or task. So common knowledge as I said, consists of what matters, the motives in each practice. And it is built when uh, two or more practices meet to discuss a complex problem and it becomes a resource. So I'm going to give you just an example of this and it's not from a research project, it's from my family. Uh, and there is my lovely grandson, Jack, who um, is autistic. Um, and uh, this is an absolute example. Um, when he, he's in a mainstream school, and, the and he moved to a new, um, a, a new school. The parents moved to sit new towns and he moved to a new school. And the teacher thought it was very important that what happened with, with Jack, he's got very poor commu um, um, oral communication, very fantastic visual communication. Um, and the, the teacher thought it was important that, re that he really should follow the curriculum. Whereas Helen, my daughter, um, thought actually it'd be much better if they built on his strengths. He's a great cartoonist, animator. He, he you know, does film, does a lot of things like that. Um, and Helen was getting more and more and more frustrated. Um, and she said, she rang me one night at about 10 o'clock, Mom, what do I do? Um, and I said, well, email the school and tell them that you really understand where they're coming from and say you really respect that what, they're, what they're trying to do and how important the curriculum is and how, and how you are pleased that they're thinking that Jack can benefit from doing on the, all of this. So look at what matters for them. Um, and then, but then also say something about what matters for you. So she, at midnight that night, she emailed the teacher and the head teacher exactly like that. By seven o'clock the following morning, she got an email back from, emails back from both of them saying, thank you. 
And actually, Jack has never looked back in that school. So what, what happened was that Helen had, in Helen's email, she had put the common knowledge, what mattered for her, what mattered for the school, and they had found a way of negotiating what, what, how, to, how to take Jack forward. And that's Jack after a year in the school, looking absolutely cheerful. So, <laughs> so, so common knowledge... Um, I mean, there are more serious examples than that, and I've seen it in play, but I just wanted to show a picture of Jack, really. Um, the, um, so building common knowledge, I think, as I, again, I've said this on, <clears throat> on, on yesterday morning, it involves recognising long-term general goals, things you can't disagree about, like children's well-being, for example. Um, but it also involves revealing categories, values, and so on in talk so we need to be clear about what our what our values are and what our motives are and it involves listening and recognizing and engaging with the categories so what what um, Mariana and I decided and came to after over that those that glass of wine at the end of a heavy day doing something else um, <clears throat> was to think about common knowledge as a bridge and this picture is supposed to be a bridge in the Botanic Gardens, but I wandered around the Botanic Gardens yesterday afternoon and I couldn't see it. Anyway, um, perhaps it had just been painted. <laughs> You'll find it, okay. <laughs> I saw one that wasn't looking quite so pristine and white, but maybe it's the same one. Okay, so, so the argument in the book is that common knowledge forms a bridge between one practice and another. And... and um, so the key things here, motive orientation captures what matters for a child or young person and how they approach the familiar and new demands. And common knowledge, matter, is, common knowledge consists of what matters for the child and the, or the young person and what matters in the practice they're entering into. So we're capturing the what matters of um, sort of the anticipated motive orientations that they need to be able to get in the new practice um, and also the motive orientations that they're bringing in. So I just want to, I'm going to put, make some, put some flesh on that with um, an example uh, from some work, a small study that I've recently carried out where um, we, I've, I've looked at how uh, an iPhone app can... Um, anchor can hold that common knowledge and actually operate as a kind of almost a physical bridge the child can carry with them when they move from one practice to another. And um, partly because I've got an, a family interest in autism, but partly because I'm a governor of a, a special school, um, I, I focused on young people with um, autistic spectrum conditions for this particular study. So. The transition into work for young people with autism um, is very, very challenging. I mean, most of the literature talks about how anxious they are, and I guess they are ext extraordinarily anxious, but I don't think anything's actually unpacked what's causing the anxiety, and I think this question of knowing what to orient towards um, uh, that comes out of Mariana's work on motive orientation I think is actually quite helpful. So... Um, Young people who, who are autistic need very clear guidance about what to do uh, because they're likely to be inflexible and to be very, but yet once they know what they've got to do, then they are very, very good at keeping to the rules. Also usually very literal and don't cope with ambiguity, so things need to be very clear. Um, and they may have very strongly held motive orientations and notice things other people don't notice, but they will also equally be uh, unlikely to notice the things that other people might think are important. Um, and so sometimes the adaptation for somebody with autism moving from one practice to another can be extremely difficult, and the anxiety, of course, makes it even more so. So, um, th as I've said here, the challenges are amplified for them. So. Um, my argument was that if we can reveal their motive orientations, what they're 
bringing wisdom from one practice. Um, and then also what matters in the practices they are entering, we may be able to help them with that transition and help them to engage with the recurrent demands in the new practices so that they can develop new competences and new motive orientations. So that was, that was what was lying behind that, that study. And the study, I carried out the study with Yvette Fay, who's deputy head at the special school. Um, and so our premise was that common knowledge can provide the um, bridge, so I've already used the bridge metaphor, which will help with the development of new motive orientations. And our challenge was to find a way of holding that common knowledge in a way that could be uh, relevant and updated. Also, um, it, it, the literature that I read seemed to say that when it, parents were interviewed, they felt they really wanted to be involved uh, it, for the, with this kind of transition, but actually there were very few examples of parents being involved. So having, um, having a, a way of involving the parents too was also something we thought was important. So we wanted to create an app, and I've, I mean it was a very small study, um, because now I'm retired I can't get funding because I'm not allowed to apply for funding. So it was... Um, Teachers at a special school, a TAFE or FE tutor, young people who are about to leave a special school. I did a focus group interviews with them, interview with them. Parents, employers, employers were utterly fantastic people, had really had, um, worked out how to support these young people, but also to challenge them as well so that they moved forward and became more and more independent. And two wonderful young men who were working for British Telecom who uh, were definitely autistic. They, 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 they had um, more uh, verbal skills than my grandson um, and they were doing, they were being paid um, just £33,000 a year which is a good salary for somebody their age in London and, and they were doing data transfer, sitting at computers with headphones on and they were working for British Telecom and they were um, more than earning their money because of their capacity to concentrate um, and not get deflected in a way that a, neuro a neurotypical person like myself would most certainly have got um, bored and, 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 and deflected. So these were young people in employment and showing actually if you can get it to work, they, they, they can be really good employees. So what, what, we, what we were looking at was what mattered, this is just a very brief summary, what mattered for the young people at school, of course they, they wanted to know the details of the workplace, but they also interestingly said things, you need to know things about me to help me at college. And, and you need to know I'm actually good at some things. And so they listed the things that they were good at. I mean, lots and lots and lots of things that they were good at. And, and we kind of forget that. And it was so important that that was also part of the what mattered that got put into the app. The young people at work, again, said something very similar. There are interesting things from, about me outside work as well, you know. Um, uh, the parents, too, I mean, I only interviewed three, but... Um, they really wanted to be part of the process. And they had so many ways of actually helping their child manage to let them go into the, into the workplace without that, that kind of um, information being made available at the very least. Uh, the employers, the young person needs to know what we expect of them in the job that we'll, that we'll be doing, which, and the young people have very unrealistic expectations of what the job would be. And we expect to see some progress over time. And then the educators, I think this is really important, the educators were doing what they could to prepare the, child, the young people for the workplace, but actually they needed to be preparing the child for specific workplaces, and of course they couldn't do that. So there's a, a real gap there that they, that they, they, couldn't, that they couldn't fill. So um, what we, um, we, this has got held up because BT has collapsed on me. They were going to actually make the, make the app, but we're, we're working on that. The idea was to create an app that will hold the common knowledge and enable the young person to develop new motive orientations and competences. And then we were going to test the app on small samples. I've got people ready to do that. And then uh, get funding for a national testing of the app. So this is what the app will look like. Uh, well, this is a wireframe for the app. 
Um, so the front, there's a front page with six tiles and tabs, and they will, these are, this is me, I am, I like to, I'm good at, um, this is where I work, and that could be filled in by the employer but when they start, or if the job changes, you know, they stop sweeping the floor in the warehouse and start going out on deliveries, for example. These are the things I want you to know about me. Um, I'm good at soccer, I like, I like doing people's hair, a whole range of things. Um, this is what I want to know about working here, and that can be updated um, regularly because we've also got, this is what I know about working here, so they can actually begin to um, have a, a record of things that they've learned as well. And this is what my employer wants me to do at work, and again, that would be completed by the employer, and that would involve parents in, in, in supporting this for some of the young people because of their literacy. But um, it would also mean that the parents know what's going on and, and can give support at home. So that's the design of the app. Um, if anybody knows anybody who might like to develop it, I'm very happy to pass it all on. Um, so it's accessible and free and, and holding the common knowledge. It reduces anxiety. It guides the building of new competencies because the young person knows what's important at work uh, because the employer is saying these are the things that are important. And the young person, and I think very importantly, the young person controls the app. It's theirs, it's in their pocket. They can add things to it. They can ask other people to put things on it. And it encourages and enables independence, which is what the employers wanted from them. So that's a very concrete example of how um, common knowledge can be held and help with the transition between school and work. Um, I'm now going to uh, move on to um, talk about two um, projects um, also in the book uh, that um, are to do with entry into school. And the first one uh, I, I, I'll just mention really very, very briefly. Um, back in um, 2008, with some colleagues in Oxford, um, I was involved in evaluating a government initiative, which was called, the initiative was called the Early Learning Partnership Project. And it it's one, was one of many um, initiatives that the then Labour government put in place around children and families. Uh, and all of them, and I was, I was involved in evaluating several of them, and all of them were set up within a risk and resilience framework, looking for protective factors to um, strengthen the resilience of the child as they moved from home to school. And they were targeted at children from the most socially deprived families. And the idea was that, um, that, that what these initiatives, particularly this one, the Early Learning Partnership would do, would be to um, build school readiness by um, helping the parents become educators of the children. Um, and so there was a huge emphasis on helping the parents um, think about how they supported their children as learners. And I was kind of uncomfortable with it um, all the way through. Uh, and back in um, you know, 20 years ago now, I came out, I, uh, I had done some work on parental involvement projects in, um, in Lancashire, a huge immigrant population there, um, uh, having one of the um, valleys in northern Pakistan had been flooded to create a reservoir. and the communities en masse had been moved to Burnley and Blackburn in, in Lancashire. And so there were, there, were, there were huge difficulties for the, for the families in, uh, in having to come to terms with living not only in cold Lancashire, but also in uh, going into British mainstream schooling. And I got so worried because I just thought that what was happening was that the schools with all the best intentions were colonizing the homes. And that's how it seemed to me that that, 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 that was going on. And so I thought there were, the ELP initiative was in a way encouraging that kind of, um, of colonization. And um, so in this rethink that uh, Maria Evangelou and I did, we thought that common knowledge is not simply a matter of home and school being similar. Interventions need to recognize that interactions in each setting contribute in different ways at different times to the development of the child as learner. 
Um, and we argued that the risk and resilience framework, which has some strengths in it, of course it does, um, should be augmented by the kind of cultural historical line that we were arguing, uh, where the values and practices of both home and school are focuses. Sorry, and, and, sorry where in which value the practices of homes and school and focuses on how children are enabled to develop as learners in each of those settings with the strong emotional charge that they get from being, being learners with their parents, but not doing the same thing. Because again, in that 1999 article, I thought what, what was happening was when we, we were putting, we were looking at uh, more and more school-like resources being put into the home, these uh, children were getting a double whammy um, because not only were they, um, their, what, their home life being undervalued, the kind of follow-up activities that their parents were supposed to be doing with them at home were not being followed up in a way, um, the way that they might have been followed up in a middle-class home in, in, in the other part of town. Um, and so they were, they were really being doubly disadvantaged. So, com so common knowledge here consists of what matters in the home and in the school. And so what matters in the home and in the school can form a bridge that will enable and support the child's transition from home to school. So this was just a, a critical rethink uh, of um, a whole series of initiatives that were, that were going on, had gone on, with all the best intentions um, between 1997 and, and 2010. Now I'm going to take you to Chile. Um, where we can see that kind of um, approach actually being put into, into action. And this is um, a study that was carried out by Christine Woodrow and Kerry Staples from the University of Western Sydney. Um, and the aim was to um, reveal how new kinds of relationships can be formed between schools and families. And they were doing this in an area um, in, in the Andes. It's difficult to escape the Andes once you're in Chile. They're, they're looming over you. But this is quite an isolated rural community in the north, towards the north of Chile. Um, and what they did was they uh, used the ideas of relational expertise, common knowledge, and relational agency as a way of understanding what was happening um, in this initiative that they were looking at. Um, and what they were aiming at doing was transforming practices and relationships within the early childhood centres in order to enable the children to um, have a smoother transition into mainstream schooling. But their starting point um, with these, what they, what they call in their, in their report, high poverty families, was dire. Um, the interactions with the families between the families and the schools were unidirectional. So this, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with all this kind of thing. Um, uh, they, and hierarchical, families were only con contacted and brought in when their children had done something wrong. Um, parents were not welcome inside the classroom. And uh, there were lots of safety protocols. So the, the, the uh, entrance to the school gate, the school gates were padlocked, parents weren't allowed in, um, and any kind of contact they had was very highly regulated by the school to be what, to do what the school wanted to do. And the family, family, the view was rather like in the ELP project that the families needed to be educated. Very um, uh, deficit model of family life. So along comes Chris and Kerry. And they create, uh, 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 they, they work with these um, preschool centers and the schools. And they now, they, this is from one of their presentations, the future of early childhood today, evidence and practice. And here is um, Chris Woodrow. Um, and some of the strategies that they used would not be um, unfamiliar um, to you. So they had visual records of shared text, so photo journals of home and school uh, life for discussion with the children, so bringing the home into the, into the school and the school into the home in the sense of, in, in a very light way. Family literacy trees where families identified what they could offer in terms of uh, literacy experiences that were not only books but, but other kinds of literacy experiences. And the tree, trees of dreams where families were able to think about their aspirations for their children. Um, 
And uh, that led to changes in the curriculum. So the, the, the teachers in both types of setting had um, a better sense of what was going on. Val they saw what the values of the home were, etc., etc. But the, but the um, initiative that I, I wanted to just focus on was something that I hadn't come across before, and that was the, the literacy cafes that they set up um, across a number of um, er um, villages in, in the area they were looking at. And these literacy cafes, Chris and Kerry say, interrupted social norms because the teachers and the parents had genuine conversations about the children. And so they would get an invitation, so come and have coffee with a teacher. Um, and in the literacy cafes, there, there would be good coffee and there would be boxes of books and things people could look at um, and talk about. But what, was, what um, Chris and Kerry argue is that the, the literacy cafes were places where common knowledge was built through the conversations that they were having. And importantly, the teachers were also saying, we are all learning. Uh, so it fostered relational expertise and it allowed relational agency to emerge because the, the teachers started to work with the parents as they adapted some of the, the processes and, and the learning environments and to build much more on what was going on in the community. So I, f I found when reading the, their chapter in the book that the, it was interesting to see how they had um, used the concepts of relational expertise, relational common knowledge and relational agency in order to explain what was happening in, in um, making those links between the, the school and, and, and family. The, the final example I want to talk about is not in the book, but it's, it's from a former PhD student of mine, um, uh, um, Prabhat Chandra Rai, who is uh, coming to Monash. He's now got a senior research po post at Monash. And he he was um, he done he's done his masters uh, at a university in Delhi, working in a school in um, in Rajasthan, and it's part of a chain of schools uh, called the Dagunta schools. And um, these, if you look at the statistics for Rajasthan, early school dropout extremely high. Uh, very few people graduate. Very few students graduate, um, and it's it's one of the poorest performing states in, in, in India. Yet the Dagunta schools were bucking that trend completely and um, Prabhat wanted to find out why. So I'm going to just go a little foray into another bit of theory before we, uh, we go, to the go to the examples. Um, this is um, Jan Derry from the Institute of Education and Jan um, works within the Vygotskyan uh, cultural historical framework as I do. And she draws on um, a work of, of, of the work of uh, several um, US philosophers uh, who have talked about working in the space of reasons. Um, and the space of reasons, to put it extremely simply, is um, a place where it's legitimate to ask for and give reasons, to explore the whys, to explore, if you like, the motives um, that people are using when they make statements or, or, or take actions. And she, in her work, has linked it with the work of uh, Joe Dern on, on uh, working in the rough ground of experience, which, of course, also fits, those of you who know Vygotsky, it fits in with sort of Vygotsky notions of, 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 of concept development. So a space of reasons is somewhere where it is legitimate and is expected that you will ask people to give reasons and you will be expected to give your reasons. And it, it argues with um, building common knowledge by potentially at least offering a set of ground rules for identifying what matters in a practice. And I've, I've had so many conversations with Jan about this because I, I, she has said we will eventually, probably, write a joint article because I think her work just plays into my concerns with common knowledge beautifully. Um, but Prabhat took the, those ideas about the space of reason and, and the rough ground and uh, and and connected it with common knowledge and uh, just a little bit about some of the things that he did so he he, he wanted to know what makes these Daganta schools so special it's a small chain of schools and he lived in a village where there was one school for six months this is his PhD he observed classes he observed teacher meetings teachers meetings with families and village school meetings 
And his initial hypothesis was that the secret was the teachers were very good at intersubjectivity, a kind of meeting of minds, and they were doing good work in the classrooms. But actually, uh, that was, that, that's what he went into, into the village um, after his doing his master's to, to test that out. But what he saw was that this meeting of minds was mediated by common knowledge, um, rather like the example I gave you with, with Jack. And teachers created... And they were brilliant. I mean, the, the transcripts of the conversations that um, Prabhat brought back were utterly fascinating. The teachers created a space of reasons into which they invited the families. Um, and the topics were challenging topics, um, like um, staying on in school instead of grinding stones in Jaipur, or completing school rather than marrying at age 14. Um, so there were very tough topics that they were dealing with, but they did it in a way that just was modeling the way that Jan Derry's talked about um, the legitimacy of um, asking for reasons and giving reasons yourselves, and such mutual respect between the, the, the families and, and the teachers. It was absolutely stunning. The um, transcripts go on for pages because they were slow conversations with lots of listening and building up, building up common knowledge. Um, and so they elicited the families' motives and made their own motives very explicit. <laughs> And, they, so, and they, in those conversations, they built um, common knowledge, which they could use. Now, they used that common knowledge, um, and perhaps thought this is where he would focus his thesis, um, they, uh, on the curriculum. And so there was uh, all the kinds of things that you might expect to see. Um, and so they worked with um, materials that are familiar with the children, obviously, the pedagogy was really conversational, requiring the children had to hypothesize. Again, the lessons were really slow, but the children were like this all the time, just wanting to have a go at things and trying things out. Um, uh, and they had to uh, hypothesize based on their own experience, on what they learned previously, trying out their ideas in practical ways, and also um, uh, talk to their parents and get their parents' views. So after a session on, on measuring area, their homework was to go and ask their father or their grandfather or their mother how, the, how their fields were measured, um, and then come back and discuss that in terms of standard measurement, measurement. But where it also was stunning, and Prabhat hadn't expected to see this, um, the teachers built common knowledge with parents, and they took seriously what mattered to the families, as I said, and they were very clear about what mattered for them. And they were very explicit about creating this as a resource that enabled them to talk. And one of the very, very long transcripts that, um, that Prabhat has in his DPhil um, was a, a, a village meeting where the teachers wanted, um, the, wanted, they knew the school, they needed a bus because the school had moved to a slightly new site. And it was very dangerous, particularly for the young women, to be walking back and forth on their own to school. And it meant that very likely that the, young, the girls might drop out of school. And they, the teachers wanted the school, sorry, the teachers wanted the village to organize the bus and to organize the money for the bus, etc., etc. And this went on for pages and pages and pages and pages of transcript. And um, in the end, the teacher said, OK, you're right. We should organize it. Um, and everybody went away happy. The ch their children were going to be safe. The girls were still going to be attending school. And they had really explored what was, what was going on. So the reasoning of the village prevailed. Um, but all the way through the conversation, that the educators revealed, this, as I put here, a commitment to a set of values. And they were constantly explicit about what those values were and the parents shared those values because they could they could align their own motives and their concern about their children with them and um, those conversations these these meetings happened every month every six weeks uh, and so there was a kind of build-up of, 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 of shared trust and I, it's but it's more than trust because I always get worried about the term trust because I <clears throat> how do you operationalize it how do you know what it is but actually what you could see was this common knowledge refer referring back to previous conversations that were brought in so um, lovely examples there and if um, when Prabhat comes in June you might want to invite him over to tell you a little bit more about it um, so reflections 
then? What are the implications for children making the transition? Um, Vygotsky talks quite a bit, or wrote quite a bit, about um, the, the emotional aspects of cognitive experience, what he called perishivanyi. And I'm quoting from a translation of his work, because he, he was dead by 1934, but, um, and it uses his in 1994 translation. Anyway, uh, the emotional experience arising from any situation or from any aspect of his environment determines what kind of influence this situation or this environment will have on the child. Therefore, it's not any of the factors themselves which determine how they will influence the future course of development, but the same factors reflected through the prism of the child's emotional experience. And although I've been talking about motive, what we're talking about is an orientation to something that becomes meaningful for the child, or the young person in the practice in which, in which they're entering. And that is in itself an emotional experience. It is, if you go back to my definition of practice, it is about the construction of identities and effective identities, agentic identities, if you like, that can work with um, the, the recurrent demands in the practice and work on them and negotiate new ideas into them, of course. So final, final reflection. What are the implications for schools and teachers? If we think of common knowledge as a bridge between old and new practices, and supporting the development of new motive orientations. There are implications for schools and teachers, and, and these are, this is a kind of almost checklist. What are the child's motive orientations? Why are they orienting in that way? Um, how do you learn about the orig origins of their current motive orientations? What, what are they interpreting as the demands? What competences do they need in order to interpret the demands in different ways? And what are the implications for preparing the child for school and school for the child? So I think I would leave those as sets of implications for schools and schooling that come out of that kind of analysis that we've done. So I will stop. So one of our um, practices at these opportunities is for someone to provide a bit of um, reflections on what the presentation meant for them. And Misty Sato has very graciously offered to oh, provide some coming. of those reflections. Oh, and then we'll you. give you a bit of a thank you to Anne. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anne, very much for sharing again um, your body of work um, with us tonight. I think that when we have the opportunity to hear someone who has been working on a set of ideas over a period of time and you can see them reflected across different kinds of contexts and in this case around the world, I feel like I just had a, a tour of the globe, um, we really get to see the strength of the ideas that emerge and in initially in our research and how they can grow and develop and be refined over time as we continue to delve into um, better understanding how the ideas are working and how the ideas work for us. So I think by hearing these examples um, that you provide around these transitions, we're able to see how everyday lived life can be interpreted and reinterpreted and interpreted again using the powerful concepts that you've given us tonight. Um, these notions of relational expertise and particularly common knowledge, which you've returned to over uh, you know, multiple opportunities to hear about how common knowledge uh, manifests in these experiences and relational agency as well, I think help give us a lens on to understanding how these complex interactions take place. And it's not that we walk through the world and, and you know, have our family interactions or have our uh, transitions with our own children in schools and then suddenly sit back and reflect and go, oh, that's what was just happening. I just did that. Uh, in the way that you've done, but I think it gives us as educators and those of us who are planning for instruction for teachers and those of us who are planning for organizational change and those who us, who, of us who are putting together programs and conducting our own research can take these as ideas as tools for our future planning and for our uh, way of building new ways to operate um, and challenging our taken for granted practices. Um, I love Joseph Dunn's work that you referenced in, in the on, Back to the Rough Ground. And I think that's an example of taking the everyday experiences that we have and challenging us to think about them in new lights. And your ideas around relational expertise, common knowledge, and re relational agency 
provide those tools for us, or those conceptual tools for us to be able to do that. So thank you very much for all the thinking that you've put into this, the multiple collaborations that you've created, um, and that you've represented tonight. Seeing real people's faces and names is another way that we can appreciate that this is not work we do alone, but it's work that we do together. So kia ora. just on the app uh, at uh, University of Sussex and somebody from the um, student access um, people came in because they worried also about young, pe young people with dyslexia and the learning disabilities as well and whether that, that you know, the app itself could be, could be adapted to that. I mean, Julie will know about Christopher Hears' work in the third space, mm -hmm. um, which, is, which, which would actually do mm -hmm. a lot of that work, sort of creating Chris doesn't use the term common knowledge, but I think I think it fits very nicely with that. That the, the, what what the people who does it with with what they call the Tino, the Tino uh, young, young people who are about to go to university, and um, the, uh, what matters for them in the sense, and or what they're bringing into the university experience, but also they become familiar with the expectations of the university and what matters in the university, and they do that discursively. But I I, I quite like the idea of the app, and I think you know once you've got sense of the ideas you can then you can then develop it and it becomes and it can be adaptable and it's there and yeah so it's an idea that might students using outside of school time mm -hmm. playing basketball yeah. and stuff. I mean, hearing that sort of thing is an option. Yeah. Um, so yeah. if you've already got a family that are familiar with physical space, then yeah. they're likely to come in. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and certainly some of the larger secondary schools are sort of created family spaces mm. uh, and they're sort of open coffee, you know, coffee bars and, and things like that. I'd like to, you know, perhaps say is that you often imagine that parents understand your system. So every subject, you start already at a level where you think the parent already understands the system. 
So there's no introduction, which is a wider thing, rather than just your thumb or just your looking at a specific area. There's no beginning. It's mm. just gone straight into that you would have this understanding, and that's for the first time that it's going to be, you know, ended into the senior to this. But I thought, oh, actually, they could just be seeing it down the road. It was a nice one for you to be seeing mm. distant, yeah. but here it seemed like.
you're aware of that and also of those schools, understanding that it's a position in which they take the initiative. And, and I think how to transition because that's the most difficult part of it. It, it, it's also a new practice. Your skill, yes, exactly. Um, I mean, I took lots of things in what you're saying. There's somebody <laughs> in, in Melbourne, a uh, Vietnamese um, uh, person called Kim Han Dan, who has looked at that transition during the, um, the year, the, the, the postgraduate certificate year, and seen the transition that goes on. And I think that's, that's also very interesting. But what you're describing also is another way, that, another way the app could be used. You're, you're talking about highly articulate people who've got values, got knowledge, and the app itself almost becomes a text that you can dispute over. You know, you can question each other over. It becomes a place where the space, you know, it creates a space of reasons almost where you can, you can question what's going on. Because our, our students, I don't know if from here, but our students don't question. Um, they daren't because they've been assessed by, by, by the metrics. So, but having a, a shared text actually becomes something that uh, gives you very good directive action. They can then use it to advantage. And we would like again to thank you very much for um, stimulating conversation and thought and you can see the different ways that people are taking those theoretical concepts and trying to figure out how they might um, drive some of our motives and help us think about some of our spaces. But I just um, want to really thank you for taking the time as you came to the South Pacific to also come to our island. And um, we have a few small tokens for you to I was thinking about you have to show back, having just come back to the States. I, I knew you wouldn't have much room. But um, a few things that you'll remember the University of Canterbury, and you'll remember um, Aotearoa, Te Wapolamu, and um, the University of Canterbury. So thank you very much. around that food can go to the doctoral student today because we know that there's always the need for some extra energy in the evening to keep the typing going. So thanks again for coming and joining us this evening.